Welcome to the Unity Workbench. This is Chris. In this video, I'll walk you through the basics of working with AR Foundation, Unity's new cross-platform augmented reality framework that will let you create content that can run on both iOS and Android. The application we'll be building is simple, but feature complete. It will contain all the basic functionality you would need when you're executing any augmented reality idea. Before we dive in, I'm going to assume that you already have some basic level of knowledge for working with Unity. Even if you don't, you should find it pretty easy to follow along. Also, I'm going to assume that you've already set up your computer for iOS or Android development. If you haven't done this or don't know how, I've provided links to Unity's excellent documentation on this topic in the description of this video. And finally, if you want to follow along, I've provided a download link where you can get the assets that I use in this tutorial. To begin, we'll open Unity, and note that I'm using Unity 2018.3. We'll create a new project, and we'll choose a location to save it, and give it a name. After a short time, the project will open with a standard scene that includes a main camera and a directional light. Don't be alarmed if your editor looks a little different than mine. I've increased the contrast on the grid lines to make them a little more visible and rearranged the panels a bit. Since we're going to be deploying to mobile devices, we need to configure a few project settings. You do this by opening the edit menu and selecting project settings, and then click the player section. I'm going to switch over to this icon, which represents iOS settings. I'm going to go ahead and fill in the company name, although this isn't a super important setting. Then we'll scroll down and look for the bundle identifier. Traditionally, this is a unique identifier that is in the format of a reverse domain name, but you can really use any unique identifier that's unlikely to be used by someone else. I'm going to choose to use the identifier the Unity Workbench .demo, .ar demo, but you should choose something different. I'm also going to turn off automatic signing. If you're using an individual Apple developer account, you might want to leave this on because it will make the setup process a little easier in Xcode. But because I use multiple developer identities for my iOS work, it's better for me to turn this off and configure it explicitly in Xcode later. Now we'll scroll down and turn on the Requires ARKit Support checkbox. Note that when we do this, it also fills in a value for the camera usage description. This can be any value you choose, it just can't be blank. You'll also notice that it gives us a warning that iOS 11 or newer is required for ARKit support, so let's go ahead and increase the iOS version number. And the final change we have to make is to the architecture. ARKit only works with ARM64 processors, so we'll select that from the drop-down list. Now I'll copy the bundle identifier because we want to use that same identifier on the Android side. So switch over to the Android settings section, scroll down to the package name, and paste the value we copied. We also need to turn off multi-threaded rendering because it isn't compatible with AR Core currently. Finally, AR Core is only supported on Android 7.0 and later. So we'll select that as our minimum API level. Okay, those are all the settings we need to change so we can close the project settings window. Now we have to add the AR Foundation library to our project. The way we do that is by opening the package manager. Then we have to open the advanced menu and turn on show preview packages. The three packages we're concerned with are AR Foundation, which is the general cross-platform API, the AR Core XR plugin, which works in conjunction with AR Foundation to allow our app to run on Android devices, and the AR Kit XR plugin, which allows our app to run on iOS devices. So let's install all three of those. And we'll close the package manager. Now when we right click in our scene hierarchy, you'll notice a new section called XR. We'll start by adding an AR session object. We won't be interacting directly with the AR session object, but it provides a lot of the setup that our scene needs in order to work as an AR scene. Next, we'll add an AR session origin object. 
The AR session origin object is important because it gives us a way to query the physical world around us and also a way to manipulate the scale of our virtual world. You'll notice that the AR session origin also includes its own camera, so we no longer need the default camera that was included in our scene. So we'll delete that. And I'll select the AR camera and tag it as our main camera. Although we don't need this specifically for the app we're going to build, it's a good practice to have one of your cameras be tagged as a main camera. So if we look at our scene, you'll see that the icons for those two AR objects are in the scene. I find them a little distracting, so I'm going to open the gizmos menu and reduce the size of the 3D icons to nothing so that they disappear. So now that we have our AR objects in the scene, we just need to create some content. For now, I'll just create a simple cube. As you can tell by looking at the grid in our scene, the default cube in Unity is one unit by one unit by one unit. The way this translates to dimensions in the real world is that each unit in Unity is one meter in the real world. So a one meter cube is gonna be way too big. So we'll scale that down to a 10th of the size, which would be 10 centimeters per side. Now we'll zoom into that cube and you can see that it's actually sitting below the ground plane a bit. So let's correct that so it looks like it's sitting right on the ground by raising it 0.05 on the Y axis. Okay, now we can try deploying to a device to see how it looks so far. For most of this video, I'll be deploying to iOS, but we'll start by deploying to Android just so you can see how that's done in case that's the platform you're working with. Select Android from the platform list and click the Switch Platform button. There, now that that's complete, make sure your Android device is plugged into your computer and select it from the Run Device drop-down list. Once your device is selected, you can click the Build and Run button. You'll be prompted for a place to save the build. I usually create a Builds folder in my Project folder, and we'll call this build Android. After the build completes, it should automatically launch the application on your Android device. Now let's look at the iOS deployment process. Back in the build window, I'll select iOS from the platform list and click Switch Platform. And then this time I'm going to click the Build button. Under my Builds folder, I'll call this iOS and hit Save. And you'll get this message telling you that there's a missing file that's required by ARKit. Just click Yes, Fix, and Build. At the end of this process, you will end up with an Xcode project called Unity-iPhone. Go ahead and open that project in Xcode. And with the Project Navigator icon selected, choose the top-level Unity iPhone node and we'll get a list of general project settings. Because I've turned off automatic signing, I have to manually select my provisioning profile that I want to build the project with. Once your project is configured with the proper signing credentials, make sure the Unity iPhone scheme is selected and the iOS device you have connected to your computer is selected as the deployment target. Then hit the Run button. This will deploy the app to your iPhone. You'll initially be asked to give permission to the camera. And now notice when I move my camera, that cube is sort of floating in space. The position of that cube is all determined based on where my phone was in space when ARKit started. To stop the application, I'll hit the Stop button in Xcode. So obviously, we'll need more control than this over where our AR content sits in the physical world. So let's tackle that next. Instead of placing this cube at a fixed position in our scene, we're going to want to place it dynamically. But before we delete it from the scene, we want to turn it into a prefab. Since we'll be adding this prefab to our scene so that it looks like it's sitting on surfaces in the real world, we want to make sure that its center point is at the base of the cube. One way to do that is by creating an empty game object, and we'll call this game piece. 
and notice that that game object appears to be sitting on the floor. So we can just drag our cube as a child of the game piece, and now it essentially has a registration position that is right where we want it. I'm going to create a new folder to house all of our assets for this project called Demo. And to turn this into a prefab, I'll just drag and drop the game piece object from my scene hierarchy into my assets window. Now we can delete that prefab from our scene. Let's refer back to the implementation we're going for. You'll notice that there is a visual placement indicator that helps the user understand where an object will be placed in the world. That's what we'll create next. We'll start by creating an empty game object and we'll call it placement indicator. And then within that object, we'll create a quad, which is the simplest piece of geometry in Unity. It's a simple flat plane with one side. I'll rotate it 90 degrees on the x-axis so that it's parallel with the floor, and we'll scale it down to that same size we had scaled the cube down to. Now we'll import a texture to use on that object. And we'll tell Unity that the alpha channel should be used as transparency. And hit the apply button. Now we'll create a new material that we can use that texture in. We'll call it placement indicator. And with that material selected, we want to change the shader to Unlit Transparent. And then we simply select that texture. Now we'll drag that material onto our quad, and we now have the visual indicator. Now we'll need to create a script to control the logic in our scene. So right click, and choose Create, C-sharp script. We'll call this script AR Tap to Place Object. Double click it to open it up in your code editor. I'm using Visual Studio Code as my editor, which is not the default. So the behavior you see in my editor may be slightly different from what you experience in your own. But as long as you follow along and type the same code in, you'll end up with the same result. I'm just gonna delete the comments to clean up the code a bit. And the first thing we need to do is import a couple libraries. So I'm going to import unityengine.xr.ar foundation. And unityengine.experimental.xr. I mentioned earlier that interacting with the AR session origin object would be a key in allowing us to interact with the world around us. So let's start by creating a reference to that session origin object. So I'll create a private variable of AR session origin, and we'll call it AR origin. And we'll save a reference to that object right when our application starts up. Now what we want to do is on every frame update, we want to check the world around us, find out where the camera is pointing, and identify if there's a position where we can place a virtual object. In order to represent that position in space, we're going to use a pose object, and we'll call it placement pose. A pose object is a simple data structure that describes the position and rotation of a 3D point. So it's perfect for our use here. Within our update method, we'll call to a new method that we'll call update placement pose. I get a red squiggly underline indicating that this method hasn't been implemented yet. In Visual Studio Code, I can just press Command period and have it auto-generate that method for me. You're probably already familiar with the physics.raycast method in Unity, which as it says here, allows you to cast a virtual ray from one point in space 
in a particular direction and determine if it hits any virtual objects along the way. Well, AR Foundation provides a similar method on the AR Session Origin object, which allows us to send a ray from some point on the screen straight out into the real world, and it will tell us if it hits any real world surfaces. You'll notice that the first parameter it requires is a screen point. We're going to want to shoot that ray from the very center of our screen. So I'll create a new variable called screen center. And to determine the screen center, which is described in pixels, we will use camera.current.viewport to screen point. And we'll provide it a vector that describes the center point of our viewport. So that's just new vector 3, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Now we'll use that variable as our first parameter. The second parameter is a list of array raycast hit objects. These hit objects represent any points in physical space where this ray hits a physical surface. So we'll just create an empty list called hits. And we'll pass that in as our second parameter. The final parameter is optional. It's a trackable type. It defaults to dot all, but let's take a look at what the other options are. These are all the types of collisions with the physical world that can be detected. The most granular and the fastest to respond is feature point. Feature point can be any distinguishing feature in our camera feed that ARKit or ARCore are able to identify. But because these features may not be on a flat surface, they probably aren't good candidates for us to position objects on top of. We also have a number of different ways to detect planes. We're just gonna choose the final one called planes, which will detect all types of planes. So after arorigin.raycast is called, we'll either end up with an empty hit list, meaning there is no flat plane in front of the camera currently, or we'll have a list with one or more items representing the planes that are in front of the camera. To keep track of this outcome, we'll create a class variable called placement pose is valid and have it initially set to false. So we'll only consider the placement pose valid if we have actually hit something. So in other words, if our hits array has at least one item in it. So now within our if statement, we will set our placement pose by looking up the first hit result in our hits array and accessing its pose property. And that's it. So now our placement pose will constantly be updated as our application is running. But the placement pose is just a descriptor of position and rotation. We haven't actually updated any of the visuals yet. So back in our update method, let's call a new method called update placement indicator. And again, we'll use the command period shortcut in Visual Studio Code to generate that method. So if we're going to update that placement indicator object that we created in our scene, we need to have a way to reference it in our code. To do that, I'll create a public variable of type game object and call it placement indicator. So now in our update placement indicator method, we'll again check to make sure the placement pose is valid. If it is, we want to make that placement indicator object active, in other words, visible. If the pose isn't valid, we want to hide the indicator by setting its active state to false. So now our indicator's visibility is controlled 
but we also need to control its position and rotation. We'll do that by modifying its transform property, calling the set position and rotation method. And here we simply reference the position and the rotation properties of our placement pose. So let's save our code and switch back over to Unity. Now we've written our code, but it doesn't exist in our scene yet. So I'm going to create an empty game object and I'll just call it interaction. It's a game object with no physical presence, but it gives us a place to hang our code. So I'll drag and drop our code onto that object and you'll notice it exposes one public parameter called placement indicator. So we'll drag and drop our placement indicator object into that field. Now we can take our code for a spin. Since we've already built the project once, we can just choose build and run and it should automatically launch our project for us without us having to go through the same setup steps we did in Xcode previously. Normally this works pretty seamlessly, but I have occasionally found cases where it fails to launch the project on the device. If that happens to you, just switch over to Xcode and hit the run button again. Here I'm intentionally holding the phone very still, but once I start moving the phone a little bit, it picks up enough information about the world around me to identify those planes. And here we see our placement indicator moving just as desired. I can even switch to the floor and it detects the floor as a separate plane. But one thing you'll notice is that as I turn my phone, the placement indicator doesn't turn. That's because the rotation of the pose returned by our Raycast is always going to be oriented to whatever direction my phone was facing when ARKit started up. It would be better if that placement indicator turned as our phone turned. So let's make that adjustment now. Back in our code editor, I'll go down to the section where we're capturing that placement pose. And instead of using the default rotation that comes with the pose, we want to calculate a new rotation based on the camera direction. So first I'll create a variable called camera forward. This will be a vector that acts sort of as an arrow that describes the direction the camera is facing along the X, Y, and Z axes. Since we don't really care about how much the camera is pointed toward the sky or toward the ground, we only care about its bearing, we'll create a new variable called camera bearing, and we'll create a new vector three using the X component of our camera forward object, zero for the Y component, and the Z component of our camera forward object. When you're using vectors to represent a direction, you should always use the normalized version of the vector. So this just gives us the direction as if Y were perfectly vertical. Now we'll do placement pose dot rotation and set it to a new value using quaternion dot look rotation and pass in that camera bearing. Let's save the code and run the project again. Now, as I turn the phone, you'll see that the placement indicator turns just the way we want it. Let's add some user interaction next. We want the user to be able to tap on the screen to place an object. So to let our script know which object should be placed, we'll create another public variable of type game object, and we'll call it object to place. Every time the frame updates, we want to check and see if the placement pose is currently valid and whether the user has just touched the screen. To do that, we can do if placement pose is valid and input.touchCount is greater than zero and input get touch zero dot phase equals touch phase dot began. So let me explain that a little bit. Placement pose is valid is fairly self-explanatory. The next section, we're checking to see if the user has any fingers currently on the screen. Then we have to check the phase of one of those fingers. Here we're choosing the first finger to see if the touch just began. 
If all these conditions are met, we can actually place the object. So we'll call another new method called place object and generate the body of that method. And this is very simple. We just call the instantiate function, pass in the object to place, and give it a position and rotation based on our placement pose. And that's it. Let's save our code and switch back to Unity. In our code, we added that new public variable called object to place. So we're going to set that to the prefab we created earlier. Now let's run our project again. That completes the core functionality for our application, but let's make the visuals a little bit more interesting by using something besides that cube. I'm going to go ahead and import a toy plane prefab that I had created earlier. Let's drag it into our scene to take a look. The first thing you'll notice is that it's very large compared to the scale we were working with before. In our previous example with the cube, we scaled the cube down so that its physical dimensions in the AR experience would be more reasonable. You might be tempted to do the same thing with this model. However, there are some compelling reasons why we don't want to scale things down that small. Probably the most significant is for any application that includes physics, because the Unity physics engine is actually tuned to work with larger scale objects. If you have anything smaller than say the size of a basketball, you're likely to get some very strange results with the physics engine. To a lesser extent, there are other features like particle systems and shadows that also require a lot of tweaking if you're gonna work at very small scales. So in a moment, I'm gonna show you an alternative to how you can change the display scale of your scene in your augmented reality project. But first, let's talk a little bit about some special concerns with visuals when working with augmented reality. I'm gonna to switch to a slightly different perspective and I want you to focus on the shadow on this wing. Notice how it's kind of blocky and fuzzy looking. Let's see if we can improve that. So I'm gonna to go to my project settings, choose the quality section and select medium, which as you'll see by the green check marks is the default quality setting for our iOS and Android deployments. Scroll down to the shadows section and you'll see the shadow distance value is currently set to 20. Shadow distance determines how far away the camera must be from the object before the shadowing turns itself off. The default value of 20 units seen here is reasonable for a large scale scene, but is way too high when we're talking about augmented reality where the user is unlikely to get more than a couple yards away from the objects. So we can greatly improve quality just by reducing that shadow distance value. I'm gonna reduce it to eight. Now you'll notice when we zoom back in, the quality looks much better. Here's the before and here's the after. We can improve it even more by changing the shadow resolution from low resolution to high resolution. There, now our shadow will look great in AR. So I mentioned there was an alternate way to change the display scale of your objects besides just scaling down the objects themselves. This is another great feature of AR Foundation. You can simply select the AR Session Origin object and increase its scale to decrease the scale of your scene. So in other words, if I want to display my objects at half their size, I would increase the scale to two. If I want to display the objects at one-tenth their size, I would increase the AR Session Origin scale to 10. Just remember the larger scale value, the smaller your objects will appear. One other thing I'll point out related to visual quality is that by default, your virtual objects will not cast shadows on the real world. Doing so is possible, but it's beyond the scope of this tutorial, 
So to make this model look grounded, I've actually created a graphic-based shadow that you see beneath it. This is just a graphic with transparency that has been applied to a quad. Okay, so now that we're using a much larger scaled object, let's increase the scale of our placement indicator. I'm gonna increase it to a scale of one, and that looks pretty good with our plane. Now we can delete the toy plane from our scene, select our interaction object, and swap out the object to place with our toy plane prefab. Now let's run the project again. Now we have our new plane prefab in place. The shadows look great. And that seems like a great spot to end our tutorial. If you enjoyed this introduction to AR Foundation, hit that like button and consider subscribing. I hope to share many more videos on AR creation in Unity in the coming weeks. Until next time, thanks for watching.